What is this? The cost of Concordia? I don't know if I watched this. <sighs> the Costa Concordia. Ship of dreams. It's been eight years. I can still smell the buffets from their five restaurants. The casino and three-story theater had hardly been used. Ah, the gym, the day spa, the sheets in her 1500 luxurious cabins hadn't even been slept in. Costa Concordia cost $570 million to build. So many chatters saying we watched it, but I don't think I watched it. And you could tell. You could really tell. Did we? I mean, there's, you know that like, there's a video. They're hoss lighting you? Yeah, that's when, yeah, that's right. I remember it like it was just a few years ago. We had left Civitavecchia, a port in Rome, and we were making our way to Savona. It was day two of our seven day journey. But that ship, aye, she was cursed. Oh my God. When she premiered, the traditional bottle of champagne bounced right off the side instead of smashing. A bad omen, but I'm not the superstitious type. <laughs> Nothing could go wrong on Friday the 13th of January. Bro, if you can't fucking destroy a bottle on the side of a ship, don't, don't operate that ship. That makes no sense. Like how, like, the, it's like the easiest thing to do, man. That is actually a fucking a badass omen. Just sink the ship. 2012, on the 100th year anniversary of the Titanic, on a ship that's also only safety rated for two compartment flooding, Especially not when you have a five-star max level captain like Francisco Scatino. A man who mysteriously rose from head of security to the position of captain within just a couple of years. He knows exactly what to do in case of an emergency. For example, when he caused this emergency in 2008, when he crashed into a port in Sicily. And in 2010, in Vanamon, Germany, when he was steering a different- You know he was fucking drunk on both occasions. That man, I'm sorry, like, I know I'm being a little Italiophobic right now, but you know my dude was just fucking wasted, dude, okay? ...ship and came into port too fast and caused another collision. I've got a good feeling about this. So let's set the scene. It's a beautiful evening. People are having fun on the slides, drinks at the bar. Antonio Magnotta is playing piano at the restaurant. The chatter asked you to watch it two days ago, then you said it was too long when it came out. Kitty Young Sun, can we watch Concordia now? Last time when it came out, you said it was too long. Martin the Magician is setting up for his show. And the ship is setting up for a little detour. It's called a sail by salute. Basically, you get real close to the shore and honk the horn. The locals hate it, but the customers love it, and it's a tradition. Scatino, the captain, comes into the dining hall with the lady, Dominica Samorton. Remember this face because you'll be seeing a lot of it later. Scatino eats his dinner with her and socializes for a little while. Then he, Dominica, and the maitre d' finish up and excuse themselves. They're heading to the bridge. It's time for that sail by salute. This time, they're going to get closer than ever. Just 1,500 feet from the island of Giglio. And how are they going to determine this distance? Well, of course, the captain is going to eyeball it. Apparently, it's not an uncommon thing to do. Scatino turns to the fella steering, his helmsman, Jacob Russlibin. First interesting tidbit. Costa Crociere has hired Jacob from Indonesia at a rock bottom price. And he's a bit of a newbie to the job. In fact, his profession hitherto, a painter and a cleaner. It's his first time steering a massive ship, and he's very excited. 
At least, we think he is. It's hard to tell because he doesn't speak English or Italian very well at all. Off to a good start. The oh second my command God. orders the helmsman to 290. Now, don't be confused by these numbers, they're just the degrees on a compass. At the same time, the captain whips out his cell phone and calls former captain Mario Palombo, who lives on the island. They chat about the safe distance to Giglio's shores. It's all very casual. Anyway, Mario says that the safe distance is between 0.3 and 0.4 miles from shore. The captain is going all in. This is not his first sail by salute, so he's confident in what he's doing. We're going closer than we've ever been before. The captain's eyeballing it again. Hmm. New heading of 300, he tells the helmsman. Downstairs, Martin is about to cut his assistant in half. And of course, that means that there's already a lady inside this box. She's waiting for the cue, and then she'll poke her legs out. The captain is giving more orders. Pulling gently to 310. Increase speed to 16 knots. Going this fast is going to be a fatal error. But before we talk about that, let's talk about another big problem. Language barrier. Because at this point, the captain says, 325, but the helmsman relays, 315. So the first officer intervenes and he goes, no, 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 335, which is also wrong. And then the captain clarifies, no, 325. The helmsman confirms 325. Their poor communication has them moving at a much wider angle than they think they are. However, the captain should and would know this, except for the next problem, complacency about procedure. The standard procedure of a ship this large is for the third officer to give exact positional coordinates every time the captain gives a new directional order. But they're not doing that. 3.30, he says. The helmsman relays 3.30. The ship reaches 16 knots. The captain then turns to the second officer and instructs him to go to the left wing. That's these things here, and they basically exist so you can get a better view over the whole vessel. A few seconds pass, and then the mood starts to turn. Scatino notices white foam of waves breaking against the rocks directly in front of him in the distance. The Costa Concordia, right now, is almost 700 meters closer to the rocks than it should be. Without deviation, there is going to be a direct collision. Oh, shit! Scatino immediately commands the ship to start turning away. 335! Not enough. The captain shouts, 340! The captain yells, 350! Now, remember how I said that accelerating to 16 knots was a fatal error? Well, that's because it's made this ship incapable of such a drastic turn. What they've got is understeer. Here's an example. The front end is not working. You're turning, 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 and you're just going straight. You want to go over here, but you're going to end up over here. So despite the order of 350, right now the bow is still only pointing at 327. Not nearly enough to miss the rock. And oh no, it's about to get worse. That language barrier again. In these critical moments where every second counts, the helmsman wrongly relays 340. The captain snaps back, 350, starboard, or we end up on the rocks. The third officer goes to assist the helmsman. Now, don't get confused by the orders from here. We're changing over to rudder instructions. The captain yells, starboard 10, starboard 20, and still it's not enough. Hard to starboard. That means as hard as it'll go. But at this point, even if they clear these rocks, they need to get the rest of the ship to swing around it. So the captain yells, midship, which centers the rudder. The bow is now less than 150 meters from Skull Rock. Port 10. But the helmsman only gets to port five before another order is given two seconds later. Port 20. They might just avoid disaster here, maybe. But then, oh no. One more time, the helmsman cocks up at the worst possible moment. The helmsman goes to starboard instead of port, undoing the swing. Eight seconds later, he realizes the error and corrects, but it's too late. He has just turned a probable near miss into a sure hit. All they can do now is hold on as the bow of the ship narrowly passes by the rocks. Hard to port! The second officer yells, we're gonna hit! Collision. <laughs> Olive oil and pasta.
Parón. Not the fucking pasta. Bad time. Downtown. Damn, dude. You know, I oftentimes appreciate like a segue when he when he hits a segue like that's a part of the fucking meme. You know what I'm saying? Like when it's top of the hour and you say like there's a six second ad break coming right now. But then you tell people like you can avoid the ads by uh, subscribing. You can use a VPN actually uh, if you want to if you want to avoid the ads. OK, or you can use an ad blocker or you can subscribe for four dollars because it's because it's uh September or for free with a Twitch Prime. But here's the ad break now. That's right. You've been getting lucky as fuck today with the ads lining up to what you're watching, I know. The ship hits rocks on the port side. A 53 meter gash opens up in the hull and thousands of tons of water begin pouring in. A loud scraping and bang is heard by all passengers. At the helm, there's panic. Rumblings in the dining room. Martin awkwardly pauses his act as he's helping his assistant into the box. Meanwhile, the lady inside is trapped and terrified. There's confusion across the ship. All of the crew off shift come back on duty. All officers run to the bridge. Technical crews run down to the lower decks to assess damage. On connection with the rocks, they lose propulsion and slow to 8.3 knots. And they are now adrift. Close the watertight doors at stern. Enormous volumes of water are pouring in. So much so that within 29 seconds of collision, all six engines stop working through flooding. 22 seconds later, a blackout happens. Bro, that's lit. He literally hit like. So what happened? He fucking hit the ship in the worst possible place. God damn, dude. Like, he could not have tried to hit it in the worst place. He could not try to hit a worst possible spot. Lights, electrics, the water pumps too. Everything. The captain orders the helmsman hard starboard. This is the final position of the rudder before power to that too is lost. The Costa Concordia, now without power, is drifting starboard. Plunged into absolute darkness. A quick breakdown of the flooding. When the Concordia struck land, it tore open three watertight compartments. At first, compartment five, which filled very rapidly. Then six, more slowly, four shortly after. Then seven, eight, and three. Modern ships are built to withstand two compartment breaches. These compartments especially though are a problem because they contain the engines and the electrics. These main generators give power to the whole ship. From propulsion motors to rudder to hotel functions, pretty much everything. When they went out, the ship was a functionless sinking cage. A few seconds later, the emergency batteries for internal lighting and communications kick on. When the lights come back on, Martin has vanished. He's ditched the stage. And it caused a huge panic in the theater as passengers are trying to flee to their cabins and to muster stations. People already in their cabins come out and start putting on life vests. Staff rally and try to calm everyone down. Everything is fine. There's no need for vests. Please return to your cabins. The emergency generator starts. Six boat engines that drowned in 29 seconds was unheard of. I mean, it seems like my man did the devious lick. You know what I mean? He just licked that fucking rock in the absolute worst place he possibly could have. Like they, that was a, that was a fucking world record hit. All of the watertight doors closed except for door 12, which is jammed. The captain calls Pilot, the chief engineer, as the ship begins to list on the port side. There's water coming in? Yes, there's water. But where? The engine room. But a lot of water? Yes! There's water, you can't go down. Let's go down the other side. In a moment we'll start the pumps, I'll let you know. In the theater, the whole magic box apparatus slides right off the stage and falls into the crowd, further increasing panic. On the bridge, an announcement is being prepared. 
They are going to lie to prevent a panic. Let's just say we have a blackout. The deputy chief engineer enters the engine control room. He confirms to the bridge that at least compartments five, six, and seven are flooded. Announcements are made. The captain. Bro, I would be calling the fucking other Italian uh, previous captain immediately and been like, yo, we're dying. Like, we're done. Why haven't they done this so far? To inform you that due to an electrical fault, which is currently under control, we're currently in a blackout. Our technicians are working to resolve the situation and we'll inform you of developments as they occur. Thank you for your attention. Coincidentally, at the same time in the restaurant, they're playing My Heart Will Go On, and it's very much not helping the situation. The captain calls the Costa Crisis Unit, Roberto Ferrarini. He tells the Crisis Unit that they've hit a rock, that they're assessing damages, and that they are also in a blackout. The Crisis Office says to reverse the ship up onto shore. Well, how are you going to do that? You don't have power to the rudder, let alone the engine. You know, hoist the sails? Anyway, around this time, the wind direction creates a starboard list, and the ship begins to turn anyway, drifting right back towards the shore. Oh! Which is a very good thing, because you want the ship to end up as close to shore as possible. A panicked passenger senses that something is- Wait, what? No, I thought that that's the opposite. I, I feel like you don't want that. I, I... Why not? What do you mean? If it's gonna sink you do i mean i guess it is already sinking so i guess yeah this isn't like any electrical problem that she's ever seen plus there was a massive crashing noise and now the ship is tilting so she contacts her daughter in italy the daughter then calls the police and the police call the harbor master while that goes on a conversation between pilon and ambrosio the diesel is not starting the captain asks the engine room but where have we made contact thinking that the incoming water can be reduced. Captain, here everything is lost. The electrical panel, everything. They're saying at this point that the ship is going down. The captain calls Roberto Ferrarini again. Uh, actually, two compartments have been flooded, but don't worry, the ship's stability isn't in danger. Wrong. Passengers begin going to muster stations on their own initiative. The cruise director says, We have a lot of people at muster stations that I do not want to fall overboard. Do we make an announcement to tell them to go to the lounges? Bozio says, I think that's best. The harbour master from Livorno calls the ship. The captain- Okay, going forward, I mean, first of all, you'll never catch me in a fucking cruise ship, okay? This is one of the many reasons, but... It's like, I'm not going in that shit. Like, I, I don't understand why people are so fucking obsessed with it. Like, I find it really silly. It's like... Even before COVID, they were just like a bacteria infested, uh, insane experience for some fucking weird reason. People uh, like to do it. But if I was, you know, kidnapped, drugged, found myself on a fucking cruise ship of some sort, you bet your fucking ass when the captain is saying like, oh, yeah, go back to your fucking lounges. I I'm going to be like, fuck, no, I'm staying right here. I don't give a fuck, dude. You will have to shoot me. Okay. I am standing on top of the fucking boat that you get onto to jump out. Okay? I'm literally standing on it. You will have to shoot me in the face. Not even on the legs. I will fucking claw my way back onto the boat. No shot. And tells them that we, we just have a blackout. How long has this blackout been going on? About 20 minutes. Have you asked passengers to put on life? Also, none of those fucking like, you know, women and children, like none of that. I'm like, nope, fuck no, dude. Absolutely fucking lootly not, dude. How about that? Nope. Nope. I'm the biggest motherfucker. I need it. I, I'm sorry. No shot. Me, my family. Okay. Maybe some cute dogs. Nope. Like maybe if I see like a, like, I don't know, like a little kid that has cancer or something like, bloop, I'll grab him and, you know, put him in my backpack or something. But other than that, dude, no shot. No women and children first. None of that shit, bitch. I saw Titanic. I'm not trying to fucking die, dude. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I'm not trying to fucking drift away on a piece of fucking wooden door or some shit. So brave. Yeah, it's called being smart, okay? <laughs> I 
<laughs> Someone... <laughs> Fuck that little kid. He going to die anyway. <laughs> ah! I can't believe he just said that. What happened to Jack was murder. Yes. It's just a blackout. I, I gotta go. The harbor master is suspicious. He says to his superiors that he thinks something more is going on. He calls a patrol boat to the area and asks them to look at the ship. Another problem. The fan on the emergency diesel generator isn't working properly. Pilon manually has to turn the thing on and off with a screwdriver so that it doesn't overheat and cause a fire. The captain is on the phone to the lower decks asking pointless questions like, is it still flooded? Yes. Yes it is. The captain is essentially in denial of the situation. The Bro, this dude is like fucking Brian Laundry, dude, doing literally every bad thing he can in a crisis situation. Like, he's done all the wrong things, dude. Does he have a manual of like what to do so he can just like avoid all of those things? It feels like, it feels like he's just looking for all the wrong things to do. Harbor Master calls again. Finally, he says, the ship is taking on water through an opening in the left side and the ship is listing. He qualifies with, no one dead or injured. The harbor master asks if he needs help. Just a tow the boat. When in reality, they need a full rescue. With three compartments flooded. My oh, man said just a tugboat, dude. What the fuck's a tugboat gonna do when the ship's underwater? The captain finally realizes that things are really bad and they are not going to improve. I was a sailor, can confirm, do everything in an emergency except procedure. The Coast Guard orders every available ship to the scene. Meanwhile, up with the passengers, the cruise director's assistant says, uh, everything's under control. Please return to your cabins or hang about in the lounges, no problem. She said this despite knowing it was wrong and that it further endangered lives. Most passengers at this point though aren't listening to this nonsense and they're busy figuring out how to abandon ship. Bang, 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 bang. Local television has already picked up the story and they begin broadcasting live radio feed from the bridge. Hey, couple. Captain, the passengers are going on board the boats. Okay, let them go to shore. So then general emergency? Wait, nah. let me talk to Ferrarini. We risk the emergency generators that do not have cooling. It has cooling problems, 100 degrees. The cooling fan has stopped. Pilon calls the bridge and tells the safety officer they need to evacuate. The safety officer relays this to the captain, but after no response, he orders the engine room to evacuate on his own. The captain says, no, stay. We're leaving. So what do we do? General emergency? <laughs> The captain tells Ferrarini that he's abandoning ship. Abandoned ship. Another announcement is made. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. The situation is under control. Please remain calm. But at this time, proceed to your master station. They're located outside on deck four. The Livorno Coast Guard calls again. The captain declares distress. The Coast Guard officially calls for rescue operations. They contact Pietro Mille. The helicopter... Luckily, they were fucking already like sending ships, I guess, because they were like, yo, fuck this captain. Bro, how do you not know this motherfucker's like hit two ships so far? Why did they let him sink a third? This guy's the John McCain of ships, dude. <laughs> like, I don't understand, dude. How? What the fuck? Like, how do you keep your job after hitting two fucking ships? Copter base commander, who then calls in every available pilot as he rushes down to the helicopter base. Pilon shuts down the emergency generator for the final time. The first rescue vessel arrives. By this point, the lifeboats are already going. Luckily, the ship is very close to shore. Oh, perhaps too close to shore. The ship forcefully runs aground, creating an uneven center of gravity, and it begins heavily listing starboard. The captain issues a general emergency on board. The announcement to abandon ship is finally called and alarms ring out. And with that comes panic. And now that they're listing, with many of the lifeboats too awkwardly positioned to enter the water, there aren't enough readily available and they have to start going back and forth to the shore, picking people up and dropping them off. The patrol boats report to the Livorno Harbour Master that the ship has run aground and is listing heavily. So the harbour master asks the captain about it, and the captain says, no, 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 the ship is still floating. Uh, in fact, we're trying to manoeuvre it onto the shore. They know he's lying. Why is he still lying? Dude, kill this man, dude. What the fuck? I'm sorry. In a video game. But also, what the fuck?
<laughs> what the fuck is wrong with this dude, bro? Hold on, I'm reversing it. Beep, 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 beep. The captain then says to bottom out the starboard anchor. So they drop out the anchors, but let out too much chain, effectively rendering them useless. The deputy mayor of Giglio, Mario Pellegrini, and tobacco shop owner Giovanni Rossi arrive at the harbour. They watch the scene unfold. What? As the first of the lifeboats arrive on shore, the deputy mayor takes the initiative and races to board one of the lifeboats, returning to the ship, and starts trying to find someone in charge. He gives up and starts helping passengers. What? Scatino tells everyone to leave and take radios, but not before changing out of his uniform and into a nice suit. Priorities. Dimitri Christidis. Bro, the most Italian man in the world, dude. What a fucking... Oh my god, dude. Yo, this is nuts, dude. This is almost as bad as the captain involved in a South Korean ferry accident where the captain abandoned the ship and left some of the students who were told to stay put to die as he and some of the crew escaped. What? And Sylvia Koronica leave with him. The maitre d' and some more can both get out of there. By this point, approximately 300 people are still on the ship. Melee reaches the helicopter base. The first helicopter, a slow-moving Augusta Bell, was already rising from the tarmac for the hour-long flight south. Bozio is the last crew member left on the bridge, coordinating evacuation. He Don't read about the Korean incident, it's too sad, it will make you too angry. Apparently, wait, did the guy kill himself? A Korean captain committed suicide not too long, not long after, out of guilt. Then leaves to help passengers board lifeboats. The bridge is now abandoned. And then, the ship's black box stops working. Apparently there were technical problems with it. That means, from here, things are going to get a little foggy in detail. What? A while later, rescue helicopters- Stop! The captain currently teaches panic management at Rome University? Are you fucking kidding me, dude? Yo, evil people always win, dude. Always. Arrived, but they're struggling to find the ship because they're ex Wait, oh, is this before or after? Expecting it to still be well above water. Passengers are scaling down the port side by ladder as lifeboats return to pick them up. This is no, no joke. Oh my goodness. Yes. not allowed to make a film I'm allowed. I'm allowed. A second helicopter, a faster model, sets off. The ship stops healing and comes to a final resting place. Now the Coast Guard calls the captain because he's just learned that the captain has abandoned ship. The captain claims, ah. Oh, uh, no, actually, I slipped and I fell into one of the lifeboats. Ooh, I'm a klutz. But now that I'm on board, I, I may as well head back to shore. DeFelco tells the captain to get the fuck back on board. And the captain kind of acts confused and then effectively refuses. So the captain makes it to shore. From here, we only have mainstream news reports to rely on, so it's not going to be super accurate. But they say that Giglio's police chief then finds 110 survivors on the rocks at Point Gabianara. And among them is the captain. It's not known whether the captain helped anyone while he was there. And in fact, the police chief claimed that he just sat on the rocks and watched other people do the rescuing. A while later, a rescue boat picks up the captain and takes him to the harbor. He speaks to the police. You kill him, I, I suspect. He then finds the ship's onboard chaplain, Father Rafael Molina, and cries to him for about 15 minutes. <laughs> then he goes to the harbor master's office to receive probably the biggest dressing down of his entire life. Port authorities ask the taxi driver to take the captain back to his hotel. The captain takes the 30 second cab ride to the Bahamas Hotel. According to the cabbie, he was beaten like a dog. He was cold and afraid. He only asked me where he could buy a pair of fresh socks. But then he perked right up again and gave an interview to a news crew. He told them that he was the last to leave. The captain is usually the last to abandon ship. What happened, Captain? We were the last to leave the ship. All day Saturday, rescuers search. Bro. He literally changed his outfit, not to like look swaggy or because it's like an Italian behavior. He changed his outfit so he could hide amongst those who are escaping. For people on the 
ship. On Sunday morning, a South Korean couple is found in their cabin, safe but shivering. They had slept through the crash and woke up unable to exit their cabin. The last survivor, Manrico Giampandroni, was found with a broken leg. He was the cabin's service director. Fuck. In the end, 32 people died. The final body wasn't discovered until nearly three years later. A crew member, Russell Rebello, and it's believed that he died a hero helping passengers off the ship. The Costa Concordia was the largest cruise ship disaster since the Titanic. And then there's the ship. This is what happens to a 110,000 ton cruise liner when it's left half rolled over in the ocean. Dude, that's so... Oh, dude. Yo, we need to ban cruise liners. I, I mean, seriously. They are so fucking... They use up so much power. There's nothing good about it. Like, it's just... They're so bad. It does look like a COD map. This isn't the end. It's just the halfway point. What most people banning the four biggest ships would be the same as removing all cars from Europe. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Are you serious? That that can't be the truth. That literally can't be the truth. That is so fucking insane. There's no way that's true. That's so insane that like every every executive in a fucking cruise ship in the cruise ship industry should be going to jail right now. Like like don't don't fucking don't don't skip go i mean don't don't pass go do straight to jail like there should be there shouldn't even be a trial everyone that has continued cruise liners as an industry needs to be in jail tomorrow if that's true they burn bunker fuel in international waters which is one grade above tar I think that means container ships, not cruise ships. They're three times the size. Like, at least with container ships, there's a need for that, okay? There is a necessity. That's international trade. Like, I'm willing and able to fucking, you know, reduce that as well. But if we're talking about cruise ships, there's nothing. Like, there's nothing, dude. Wait. I need my luxury vacation too. Bitch, fly to fucking a nice place, okay? The fuck do you mean luxury vacation? Just fly to a place instead, please. <laughs> like, that's so stupid. I don't understand it. No, is that the Costa Concordia had crashed many days. I'm a chef and working as a cook on a cruise line is modern day slavery with work weeks up to 9 to 120 hours. Some cruises that leave US borders will pay you under minimum wage. And then the captain abandoned ship like a coward. But there's a whole veritable spaghetti of details to untangle. Let's dive in. There they are. The deets. Confirmed liberal slash send them to jail. You think it's liberal of me to fucking want to jail executives? What planet do you live on, dude? Dumbass. Also, it's your... Hey, man, I don't know if you know this, but like... You live on this planet too, you fucking idiot. That's the funniest part about people who like... 
tell me that I suck for, you know, advocating uh, for, for measures to like at least somewhat limit our emissions so we can tackle the climate change crisis. It's like, bro, you live on this planet. Like, bitch, you don't live in Mars. You live here. The fuck do you mean? Like, oh, stupid liberal, dude. No, I'm going to keep fucking dumping toxic waste into the fucking water. Fuck you, dude. Blue box time. The Costa Concordia was more than just a floating resort. There's a mall, a casino, cha-ching, cha-ching. This iron chest was full of safes and cash registers and expensive fittings. And there were plenty of gamers prepared to sneak by authorities and try their luck in the hot zone. Within days, police divers reported that valuable items, once seen lying around the ship, were now missing. High-end liquor, expensive furniture, dining sets, cash from the casino, cash rich. Bro, who the fuck? Bro, who's stealing dining sets, dude? But, yeah, those are some devious-ass licks, but, like, the dining set is, like, the dumbest thing you can steal. <laughs> what the fuck? Registers, jewelry and display cabinets, safes, Japanese woodblock prints by famous 18th century artists. What the city don't know? As well as the iconic bell, which hung from the bridge of the ship. It was never found. <laughs> Who steals a big fuck off bell? Even the server admins were getting involved. Four divers who were part of the company contracted to refloat the Concordia were spotted on CCTV, sneaking out to the ship. A patrol boat was dispatched, and the men were caught inside the fancy suites with rucksacks full of stolen goods. The four men are charged with stealing and thieving and pinching. Later oh on, stolen as well as legitimate items found their way to Amazon and eBay. Chips from the casino, postcards, and cabin access cards became highly sought after souvenirs. It even has a watermark. Some Australian guy even made a listing for the ship itself, advertising it as buyer to collect. And although there were plenty of bidders, eBay pulled the plug. <laughs> Yo, dude, we're so stupid, dude. We're the dumbest. I know you want Siskatino to go to jail, and we'll get to that. But first, we have to talk about someone else. Domnika Samorton. That was a close one. There was speculation that she was on the bridge that evening because she was the captain's mistress. Tense media speculation. I mean, there he's Italian. Like, that's... Yeah. Of course, dude. I I'm confused. Like, look, if you're gonna, if you're gonna criticize, if you're gonna criticize the captain for being a fucking dipshit, that's one thing. We're gonna criticize him for having a mistress. I mean, that's you're being Italianophobic. This is a part of the culture. Okay, you are. You are, absolutely. You're you're attacking Italian heritage right now, and that's completely, completely unacceptable. That's really fucked up. Reports that her presence distracted the captain. They both denied their love for years and maintained that they were just friends. Although, she did later admit to the media that she found him handsome. And how could you not? You so fucking precious when you smile. But she says there was no romantic link between them. Some people would like to believe, they want to know I have something with him, it's more interesting, it's like, you know, some spicy, spicy. in the story. Mr. Morton also loved the spotlight, however. Oh, everyone! Oh, look! And took several interviews. But as the pressure mounted upon her, she began making ominous threats to Scatino, saying he must confess, and that you have but one week to come clean. But things from here get weird. Spicy. Sir Morton is a bit of a wild card. <laughs> In a subsequent interview, she claimed a helicopter came to the ship well before the other rescue craft to take away a package. Huh? huh? And what was that package? Drugs, apparently. So rumors began that the ship was running narcotics for the Mafia. And not without cause, a number of cruise ships, even recently, have been caught trafficking drugs. As an aside, Scutino was tested for drugs immediately after the crash. He tested negative for drugs in his system, but trace amounts of cocaine were found in a hair sample. Okay, again, again, 
you know, attack the man for things that do not pertain to his culture and his heritage. I'm sorry. This is inappropriate. I, I draw the line here, okay? What did I say? What's next? Are you going to get mad at him for eating pasta? I mean, this is... Doing cocaine, sometimes trafficking the cocaine that you're doing, and, you know, banging other people's wives is a part of the culture, okay? Berlusconi, I rest my case. Is it smoother and less dry? Nonetheless, the Concordia was searched and no drugs were reportedly ever found. How did we get here? Oh, right, a helicopter. Sir Morton commented on it again the next day and said, actually, that helicopter was just for the captain as a means of evacuation from the ship. Okay. But they didn't have... Okay, wait. So she expected to get some sort of first class rescue while everyone else was still stuck on the ship? Wait, how did we get here? Oh, right. Sex with the captain. Divers were quick to head to the captain's cabin where they found Miss Sir Morton's lingerie and other articles of clothing as well as a makeup bag. The jig was up, but they continued denying it. Sir Morton mostly faded from international attention until she was told to appear before the court to present witness testimony. She was 17? Okay, that's literally Italian heritage. Oh my God, that's Berlusconi to a T. That's, that's Berlusconi. I'm not even kidding. That's literally what Berlusconi did. That is exact. Okay, people don't know this, so I'll just show it to you. On. The term bunga bunga is a phrase of uncertain origin and various meanings that dates from 1910, but uh, is closely associated with Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi, who looks literally identical to the sea captain, okay? A century later, the term bunga bunga became popular again as part of the joke on the internet. This joke was then narrated by Italian Pri uh, Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi at his dinner parties. Okay. This expression was then frequently quoted. Da, 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 da. Okay, wait, hold on. Why did I just like look that up? Like, why don't we just like fucking? Here you go. An aspiring model and part-time belly dancer claims she witnessed sex orgies at the villa of Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi. Age of consent in Vatican City is like 12. Jesus Christ. Oh, she was 23? Oh, uh, too old. No longer Italian heritage. Never mind. I take it back. The judge pressed her to be truthful about their relationship, or she would be held in contempt. You're getting gaslighted by libertarian? She was not 17? No, the, the girl that Berlusconi, the, the prostitute, or the sex worker that Berlusconi had sex with was 17 years old. Yes was accused of formerly convicted of paying a 17-year-old Moroccan prostitute, Karima El Marug, also known by the stage name Ruby Rubicori, Italian for Ruby the Heart Stealer, for sexual services between February and May 2010 when she was under the age of 18. He was, not, he was found not guilty on appeal. He was found not guilty on appeal also, formerly convicted of malfeasance in office. For the record... <laughs> they said, eh... They said, hey, listen. <laughs> they said to him, hey, it's, it's a culture. It's a part of the culture. It's okay. <laughs> and they let him go. They said to him, come on, it's okay. Prostitution trial, not statutory rape trial. Yes, because he was 19, she was 17. No, he wasn't. He was like 60. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, the court said, that's illegal? I don't understand. Uh, okay, uh, also, uh, I believe the, uh, the, I don't know what it, how it pertains to, like, professional sex work, but age of consent in Italy is, like, much lower than America, for the record. 
I don't know how it works for sex work though, but Age of Consent is 14. Jesus Christ, dude. Yeah, he had uh, charges up to 15 years in prison. Paying for sex with a minor in Italy is punished within a range of six months to three years imprisonment, while the crime of malfeasance in office is more severely punished from four to 12 years imprisonment and is considered a type of extortion committed by a public officer. But I guess he, uh, you know, he was able to get away with it. I don't know. Like in Italy, if he didn't pay for the sex, it's legal if she's 17 and he's like 70. But if he paid for it, then it's illegal. See, neither having sex with a person between the ages of 14 or 17, nor adult prostitution is illegal in Italy, but paying a person under the age of 18 is a sex, uh, is a crime punishable by up to three years in, in prison. Italy is very, um, how you say, libertarian. Tell me the truth or shut up. So finally, she admitted it. Si. Yes. Italy does have a close in range rule where you're 13 year old, but you can legally consent to partners who are less than three years older. They got 13 year olds legally fucking. I had a sentimental yeah. relationship with the captain. Stop. But now, stop asking about my private life. She was indeed the captain's lover. What is up, Trouble Alert Nation? What's it, team? No, she did. I'm his wife with C or 10. Oh my god. She and Scatino <laughs> have been having an affair for several weeks. <laughs> so stupid, dude. <laughs> what a fucking idiotic edit. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious, dude. Hey, speaking of, yeah, speaking of fucking Asian consent laws, my god. She also said that on the night she boarded, she didn't have a ticket. Ticket, please. And didn't need to pay because nobody questions you when you're the captain's lover. Naturally, she gave another confusing interview after leaving court. I want to say that today is the second time I die because the first time I die in the night of the crush with my psychological brain and uh, problems. And today I die the second time because, of course, people <laughs> find out something that I try to hide. Subsequent to the trial- You know, people actually died, right? Like, 33 of them. Kind of a weird fucking thing to say, dude. Holy shit. While she used her fame in Moldova to become a political activist, often appearing on television and radio and in articles covering protests, accompanied by pictures of her being arrested by police. <laughs> She's complaining that there aren't enough bins in the area. The police are telling her to calm down and point out that there are bins right there. The crowd is standing around and telling police she's allowed to protest here and generally white knighting. <laughs> she's saying this is normal. Look, trash everywhere. It's normal. Oh my god, dude. Holy fucking shit, dude. This is awesome. This is fucking hilarious. See, this is precisely why. Look at this. You see this? The brazen intellectual. She kind of batty, though. Like, that's... That's how she's getting away with it, dude. It was some stuff about victims of violence, women's rights, Girl power. yada yada yada. And interestingly, part of a push to block the sale of shares of Moldova's train network to Russia. Sure, sure. Other than that, I don't really know what she's been up to. Let me just check on her Insta. No, oh God, not again. <laughs> Somebody stop her, dude. Several civil suits were quickly lodged against Costa Crochier, and their parent company, Carnival Cruises, immediately saw a share drop of 23%. Passengers sought compensation for their damaged mental health, lost belongings, and loved ones. Either they allowed him to divert from his course, or they didn't know 
where their billion dollar ship was. Within a few days, facing financial and media pressure, the CEO attempted to join the bandwagon against the captain and the crew. That was not the ordinary route that the ship was taking at the time and, and was not only taking by the time the, the ship. Like that guy should go to jail uh, and not just because of the fucking deaths, but because of his contributions to fucking uh, climate change. You know what I mean? Like he, he should be in jail right now. I don't know why he's. Makes no sense to me. Junior. Claiming that the ship was not approved to deviate from the route. But that wasn't true. Approval isn't required if the ship is deviating by less than 15 miles, or that it was against company rules. Also untrue, because investigators found that they didn't have any rules about deviating route, and they tacitly encouraged sail by salutes. Now, in response to the civil suits, Costa Crociere offered passengers 11,000 euros each as compensation. That's kind of small. 11,000 euros, about $14,000, is the minimum compensation under international law when a ship is abandoned. This Bro, I fucking hate, dude. Oh, fuck this world, dude. Yo, capitalism is great, though, you know what I mean? It's fucking tight, dude. Hey, here you go. We almost murdered you. It's $14,000. Oh, were you murdered? Here's $14,000. What, what's up? What's the problem? $14,000. This was to reimburse them for their tickets, as well as any costs they accrued in having to unexpectedly travel home early. And that was supposed to release them from everything and anything that has to do with this accident. I cannot ask for more than this. A lot of passengers, understandably, were not too happy with this deal, and they refused. How much would the socialist cruise line give you? Dude, it just would not exist. I don't think it should exist. I think literally... I think that there should this should not exist. Like cruise lines should be illegal. Used to take the money. We think the offer is an insult for what these poor passengers went through. We think that the compensation being offered is not commensurate. Here, take it. Go ahead. Compensation being offered is not commensurate. Later. Costa Crociere would lodge a plea deal with the Tuscany court to pay a one million euro fine to avoid a criminal trial. The judge agrees. Costa Crociere is now off the hook. What? Dude. Oh my god, dude. Oh my fucking god, dude. Dude, these people are, they're so powerful. What the fuck? Dude, god damn, the Italian court system is just like, it's literally dog water, okay? It is, it is, uh, like, I can't believe we trivialize and, and, you know, consider, like, developing nations barbaric, barbaric, barbarian, whatever, and say, like, oh, dude, there's this banana republic, banana republic. Like, what the fuck is this, dude? This is the pasta republic. One million euros, dude? Are you fucking kidding me? It's just so fucked up, dude. It's so fucked up. Hook That's for insane. all criminal liability for the whole thing. It's they washed insane. their hands of the incident and flecked the residual droplets of responsibility onto the faces of six staff members. Passengers and relatives of the dead are livid that the company has been able to avoid criminal responsibility. The offered is not commensurate. Civil suits against the company continue. By the way, the residents of the island of Giglio also banded together and sought damages. They didn't get much. <laughs> Eventually, passengers who refused the initial compensation of 11,000 joined civil parties against Scatino in his trial in 2015. It's not they were awarded 30,000 euros each. Other cases, especially those involving lost relatives, are settled for undisclosed amounts. It's still dog shit. If they had stood by... If they had stood by, like, and many people did not actually, uh, take the 11,000 compensations, they would have been able to bankrupt the company entirely. They would have been able to bankrupt it in its entirety.
New York attorney Peter Rene traveled to Budapest to represent six real survivors of the disaster. At Rene and Rene, we personally work on every case. And we'll work harder than anyone to get you the most money possible in the shortest amount of time. And while on the job, a seventh case cropped up oh, via okay. email. An elderly woman, a loner, said, Help me, Mr. Ronai, for I have lost my daughter, Eva, and my five-year-old granddaughter, Roxana. So Mr. Ronai agreed to speak with her. However, there were some inconsistencies in her story. Neither Eva nor Roxana were on the passenger list. Odd, but Costa is known for having stowaways. Gotcha, bitch. Still, Mr. Renai was suspicious. They wouldn't cheaty old Petey, would they? Renai inquired further about why she was on board, especially without a ticket. Ilona said, Well, I don't know, but you should ask her boyfriend. Zolt Horvath. He'll know all the details. I'm up all night. I'm going crazy, he said. But Mr. Renai was still suspicious. Because then she asked, How much money do you think this is worth? Uh... This is a huge red flag, Petey. In 20 years of doing this, you've never had anyone ask about money. Why now? So Mr. Renai hired an investigator and sent photos around of the missing girl. The next day, the phone rang. Oh, hoi hoi. It was the boyfriend again. Ah, uh, look, there's been a bit of a misunderstanding and the child isn't missing at all. Uh-huh. And then he claimed he was confused because he had done too many drugs the night before. Oh. Okay, can I speak to the daughter then? At first, he was refused. In 2017, Carnival cruise ships emitted alone 10 times more cancer-causing sulfur dioxide than all of Europe's 260-plus million passenger vehicles. Okay, jail. I, I, I don't get it. What's the problem? Uh, throw the guy in jail immediately. Like, throw the executives in jail, like, now. So, Renai said that he'd have to file a missing persons report to the police if he couldn't. The boyfriend relented. That night, Renai met with Zolt and brought the police with him. He speaks to the granddaughter and asks her if she's seen mum. Yeah, I saw her today. Oh, really? Yeah, we went to the park today and we went on the swings. Oh no, the jig was up. So the mum walks into the room sheepishly. It's a miracle! And the story changed again. Okay, I'm not dead, but I did injure me leg when I jumped from the ship. And then I immediately flew back to Budapest. Although don't worry about checking my leg because there are no visible marks or injuries. Uh, old Petey, I'm beginning to think they weren't even on the boat. Also, it turns out this lady isn't her mum, it's just a neighbour. Eventually, Renee managed to make the pair confess. And then they said, hey, we haven't done anything wrong. We haven't taken any money. And in the end, it looks like there'll be no criminal punishment for the scam. Because Hungary, a former communist country, has no laws against insurance fraud on the books. The Wait, what? Sleeps, call 1-800-664-7... Oh, that's about it. Yeah. Oh, that's a very bad idea. <laughs> Mario, would you teach me some Italian? Authoritarian take, the obvious solution is fund alternative cruise ships, power sources, electric cruise ships that will use less greenhouse gas. Elon could easily do it with a small government investment. I see where you're going with this, and I'll take it one step further. We get Elon Musk to build these lithium, uh, these lithium batteries, okay? And then we put all the executives in one of the cruise ships. See where I'm going with this? And then, you know, hey, if it, if it turns into a yet, yet another Tesla oopsie on that cruise ship, then who cares? You know, they, they got to test it out, though. You know, Elon can be on it, too. Elon can be on the ship, too. And then who knows what happens? You know what I mean? Yeah, just let the cruise ship autopilot uh, do, the, do the steering. Oh, of course. Means Get back on board, for fuck's sake. Okay, thanks. Gregorio de Felca, the naval officer who shouted at Scatino to Vada a bordo caso, became a bit of a national hero overnight in Italy. He, like the rest of the world, expected Scatino to go down with the ship. And when the captain chickened out, de Felca was there to admonish him. And when he stopped answering the radio, he called him on his cell phone to continue putting him on blast. 
When the captain first reported, just a blackout, DeFelco didn't believe the story and immediately began preparing a rescue effort, which likely saved several lives. His actions were applauded by most Italians who were tired of their public servants being corrupt and avoiding responsibility. Accordingly, shirts sporting Vada a bordo caso were being printed by the end of the week, others setting it as their phone's ringtone. But then, in September 2014, without warning, DeFalco was transferred to an admin role in the Coast Guard. Hear what I said, you've been demoted. DeFalco said that he had been passed up for promotion, that he had also not been told which admin office he was even being transferred to, and that it all effectively cancelled 10 years of his career. DeFalco was tres furioso, and there was public speculation that it was owing to bad blood between himself and Admiral Delana, his former boss. His status among the public overshadowed his superior in many ways. On the other hand, his boss said, ah, no, it's part of a normal career progression for naval officers and that he must show more maturity and professionalism to advance his career. Now, it's hard to know what's true in office politics, but let's leave that alone. And anyway, in 2018, DeFelco said buenas noches, ya later, to the Italian Navy to become a politician. In March that year, he was elected to the Italian Senate, serving as a member for Livorno. Uh-oh. What party did he join? No, no, no. Hold on. I don't know. Did you say? I want to know. Livorn? Oh, it's the fucking, it's the, wait, it's the Communist Party. Stop saying the Ravioli Party. But I don't know. Hold on, hold on. What's the name, what's the name of the fucking guy again? And that he must show more maturity and professionalism to advance his career. Now, it's hard to know what's true in office politics, so let's leave that alone. And anyway, in 2018, DeFelco said buenos... Bro, you guys suck, dude. Like, y'all actually fucking suck. Uh, uh, oh my god, Sunday chat is just like a different demon, dude. No, he wasn't, he didn't join the Communist Party. He was a member of the left wing, left wing of the movement. is considered to be very close to the president of the chamber. Is this interest party? What is this? Populist, anti-establishment, environmentalist. However, from 2014 to 2019, M5S often supported right-wing policy, especially on immigration. Oh, God. Ugh. <sighs> New right and right-wing, despite promotion of policies usually advocated by the Italian left-wing, such as uh, citizens' income and green-inspired policies. It's not as you later to the Italian Navy to become a politician. In March that year, he was elected to the Italian Senate, serving as a member for Livorno. He still serves there today. I'm the company. The day after the disaster, Scatino was taken into custody by police and underwent questioning. However, it was clear that this would not be a straightforward investigation. So the judge released him under house arrest at his home in Sorrento, a town in Napoli. By July of that year, the house arrest was relaxed and he was allowed within this general area. While under house arrest, he wrote a book with this journalist from Rai magazine. I have no idea what it says, I don't speak Italian. 
But God damn it, he must have some kind of charisma going on because there's been a lot of speculation in the press that he had an affair with her as well. You can't keep getting away with it! Oh, hold on, I got it, I got it. Not content with abandoning his ship, this dude is determined to abandon his wife as well. So, Scatino and five others are facing criminal charges. Straight away, everyone lodges a plea bargain with the court. And all of those plea bargains are accepted, except for Scatino's. And the condition of everyone's reduced sentences are that they must provide witness testimony against Scatino. He touched me. Ciro, Jacob, and Silvio were all given suspended sentences. Throw the book at this motherfucker. Roberto and Manrico are able to opt for community service or house arrest. Not a bad deal. A good deal. A good deal. And that meant that Scatino was now all on his own. Ciro, the first officer, was the first to give his testimony. On the witness stand, he claimed that Scatino was distracted by his mistress and other guests on the bridge. That there was confusion over who was in command. Then it was Jacob's turn. And he said, Lamau XD, because he didn't actually bother with his testimony or his reduced sentence. He just fled the country. It took authorities 12 months to eventually track him down on the outskirts of Jakarta. And when they said, Oi, we still want that witness testimony. He just scalped again. And he hasn't been found since. After that, Ferrarini gave- He did the fucking race, dude his testimony then so uh, he said fuck beating a case bitch i'll do the race look we don't have time to relitigate the whole trial so let's just go straight to the verdict guilty scatino was found guilty of multiple manslaughter causing a shipwreck abandoning ship and lying to authorities he is sentenced to 16 years and one month in prison but wait there's still the appeal that's the wild yeah of course 16 years for murdering 33 people it's Italy, dude. And I bet his prison is like fucking actually kind of tight too. Like it's probably not like dog shit prison. The appeals trial begins. And the verdict on the appeal? Surprise! Rejected. So Scatino's lawyers appealed again. And the verdict on the final appeal? Bro, that is so Italian. Dude, look, look. Again. And the verdict on like this is the most Italian lawyer, dude. Look at this. This is my lawyer dog. I'm only going to jail for 16 years for murdering 33 people. Like, look at this. Man, I love Italy. Holy shit. Left this molding over prison sentence? No, I'm not. On the final appeal. Scatino made multiple attempts to secure a plea deal, but was denied by the prosecution each time. The prosecution called for Scatino to be sentenced to 26 years in prison, calling the incident a titanic affair. Oh, okay, I see what you did there. Scatino was not present. His lawyer stated that he was waiting outside of the jail for the ruling, so that if his plea was rejected, he could immediately start serving his sentence. And with that, five years and four months after the disaster, he was finally in a cell. And I will not be making any comments. Oh, oh, that hurt. What? No. The salvage operation was enormous. It took over two years and cost an estimated $1.2 billion. Beginning in early 2012, they first spent two months pumping fuel from the ship's tanks. At the same time, they had to pump seawater in so that the balance wasn't affected and the ship didn't slide around. In early 2013, a platform was built under the ship to prevent it from falling further. Sponsons were then attached to the sides of the ship and cables attached to the underwater platform. The sponsons were then dragged underwater and opened up to allow the ocean to fill them. The ship could then roll over properly. By late 2013, the ship was upright once more. What? The sponsons were then attached to the side of the ship to help keep it balanced. It now rested partially above water and crews could walk around safely. By July 2014, the water was removed from the sponsons and compressed air was pumped in to lift the ship. And she was ready to cruise again. This time to a port in Genoa. 
It was a four-day towing journey to the docks where a two-year process of dismantling and recycling would begin. That same weekend of the towing, mm. Scatino was busy. He was the guest of honor at a white party on an island in the Bay of Naples. He appeared on the front page of a local- Wait, what? Wait. Oh, oh, before he went to prison, he was while under house arrest. ...newspaper, flanked by two of Italy's most eligible bachelorettes. Anyway, so these are the things that I remember from the Costa Concordia. That sweet maiden of the sea. And as for you, little fella. Well, it's time to return you. From whence you came. Bro, that's 48 minutes, bro. Six quick things. One, NordVPN, good product, check them out. Number two, there's a new video on the second channel. You probably didn't see it because- Bro, I'm not gonna watch another fucking video, dude. I'm not gonna watch a, a, another a video tonight that's 48 minutes long. We'll get to it tomorrow.